Hello again. Thank you for being with me one more time this week. I appreciate you uh, joining us via YouTube or Facebook, wherever you are watching. I know that some of you are probably really wondering by now what our plans are. We hope to make uh, some decisions this week. I will inform you that we have uh, all of our network in. We are currently waiting on one small piece of equipment to enable one of our televisions in one of our buildings. And so we are very, very close. The network has been tested somewhat. It's working great. And so you'll be able to see and hear wherever we are or you are in the buildings. Um, And so we hopefully have that, uh, hopefully we will have that mapped out this week and know exactly the procedures we want to share with you. Still keeping an eye on the infection numbers. Again, I'll remind you that our area is extremely hard hit. Um, I, I know I know of other pastors in our area themselves who have um, contracted the virus, and there are sick folks everywhere where uh, churches have have opened, and we just still need to be careful. I know that a lot of things are flying around and being said, but I promise you, again, we're trying to make the best decisions we know how to make on your behalf. And so we will get back as soon as we can. Again, our buildings are almost ready for that to happen. Just a couple little things. All the heavy lifting's been done. And so we have video camera in place and other things so I want to thank everyone who has worked so hard for that. I'll mention Doug Buff and Jimmy McNeely, Keith Carswell, um, Sullivan Strong. Uh, there are others, I'm sure, that I and our deacons. I want to thank them for all of their hard work in helping me uh, to have wisdom, uh, to know what to do. And then from here going forward, our, our deacons are going to be taking the leadership uh, in the building when we meet together again. And so we're going to be asking you to follow their lead. And, and uh, again, all of our, all of our folks uh, who have helped and who are working, I again want to thank you. So today we are here on this Lord's Day to study the Word again. We are once again in Romans chapter 12. I invite you to find that place. We're looking again, continuing to look at those first two verses, maybe saying some things you've never heard before. Our context is different. We're not trying to change the original meaning, but my goodness, how often applications change when we are faced with something. So hopefully this is a blessing to you, and we are continuing to look at this idea of dying to live. Now, before I go to that, let me also remind you that you not all of you have returned the survey card we sent. We really need your help in that. So only around half of you have returned that as of this recording. So would you please, please take time to fill that card out. That will tell us what you're thinking, how you're feeling, where do you think you want to go. We need that to be able to plan uh, correctly for our reopening. So please help us with that. It should have a stamp on it. You return it. And it won't cost you anything but a little bit of your time. And we really would appreciate you doing that. So now we do turn again to God's Word, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, as we continue to look at this idea of dying to live, something that the world doesn't understand, but Christians are commanded to abide by. We'll continue to explore this now. Here in Romans chapter 12, we are continuing to look at this idea of dying to live. Paul is writing his great, great document on the faith, on the the salvation that God has delivered through faith uh, to those whom he has called, those whom he has chosen, those of us who have been brought unto him and those he has redeemed. Uh, We learn through this entire book that we are not saved by our works. We are not saved by our own abilities. Uh, So much of false religion, actually I would say all false Christianity, has this as its major flaw, is that uh, salvation is by works. Not so with true Christianity. Uh, There's nothing we can do to either save ourselves or to keep ourselves saved. Uh, Both of those actions are wrought only by the power of God through the finished work of Christ and the agency of His Holy Spirit. 
And so when we come to chapter 12, Paul is entering into the, into the practical or applicative section of this letter. Everything he has said to this point has been deeply doctrinal. It has been deeply, uh, it's been based on deep thoughts and principles and, and teaching about who God is, what man's condition is, the way God has justified, the way God has, has um, brought us to himself, the way God has saved us, and, and how God has averted his wrath from our life. All those things come together to form uh, the gospel, and, and it is singularly um, the only form of religion that does not, again, involve man's works where he has to do something to appease uh, some God somewhere. We cannot appease God. The only person who could appease the wrath of God was the person of Jesus Christ. Therefore, that is why he died on the cross to take upon himself our sin, pay for them willingly so that we would not have to pay for sin. Christian never pays for sin. If we had to pay for sin, it would be in hell. But that's not going to happen for those who are the true redeemed. But what do we do with this? These are wonderful truths, and and thank God that they are true. But, but now that we know them, now that we have been informed by Paul through these first 11 chapters of this great letter, what are we to do with that? Well, in chapter 12, Paul begins this portion of his letter where he applies these truths that he has thus far uh, communicated to those Romans and also to us. And the first thing he says is that we are to, uh, by the mercies of God, present our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He continues that we are not to be conformed to this world, but that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind that we may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We have approached this by trying to ascertain the areas where Paul has built on on the first part of the Romans letter. Uh, The word therefore in verse number one is so important. We've mentioned that the past two studies in this. It tells us that this statement, as as important and uh, as indispensable as it is, is closely tied by that one word to everything Paul has said to this point. Therefore, he says, I beseech you that you present your bodies. What does the therefore mean? It, It means that everything up to this point that I have said, I'm basing this next statement on. This is why you present your bodies a living sacrifice. So having uh, that in mind, let me review for us uh, very quickly uh, what what we have said. The first idea that we mentioned, the first foundation upon which is built, uh, Paul is building this application, is that we should definitely present our bodies to Christ because of the price he has paid for us. It's always good to remember that we are not our own. In America, American rugged individualism is king. It is the god of the American mindset. In the Bible, rugged individualism, frankly, does not exist. It is an antithesis to everything God teaches us in his word. While we are individually saved and born again, we only find our identity in a corporal body, a corporate body, I should say, the church. We only find our identity among the bride of Christ, among the church of the living God. And so all of us have been bought with a price, the price of his blood. And the fact that he has bought us with his precious blood, as Simon Peter has said, not of silver and gold, but with his precious blood, uh, we ought to recognize that it is our our earnest, our simple uh, duty to present our bodies a living sacrifice. And of course, we, we highlighted the idea of redemption here. This is the basis upon which Paul makes that argument. He does that in chapter 3. I'm not going to go back and read that today, but but there on your screen you see those verses, how that we are justified freely by his grace through the adoption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God, uh, Paul says, um, has brought forth to be a propitiation through faith 
uh, for us, to declare his righteousness. Propitiation means he satisfied God's wrath. All of that was his paying of a price to redeem us. The idea of redemption in the minds of Paul's readers would have taken them directly to a a slave trading block where uh, slaves were bought and sold. And the picture Paul is drawing here is one of Jesus Christ having paid the price for our possession, for our redemption. He bought us, he owns us, so that he might set us free in him. So the first foundation Paul builds that statement upon, that the therefore is mentioned for, is because of the price that he paid, the redemption that Christ has wrought. Now, I want to move on now to the second foundation, I think, that Paul uses here from the book of, of, um, of Romans. And so I think that he is saying that we are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, not only because of the price that was paid, but secondly, in view of our past. What has God done with our past? Well, I can't help but to think that Paul has in mind what he said in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, and also in chapter 6, verse 13. Let me read these for you now. Paul said, what shall we say then? Tremendous beginning to that chapter. All of these chapters are just tremendous in their own right. Chapter 6 and 7 are really the keynote passages for a believer's uh, ability and instruction in living a life of righteousness in a practical way. How is it we do that? Well, Paul begins chapter 6 by asking the question. We've been talking about all this righteousness, Paul is saying. Uh, We've been justified. We've been forgiven. We no longer are held accountable for our sin. There's no condemnation. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then Paul uses this this uh, very negative wording, God forbid, meganoito, God forbid. And it's a very strong statement of negativity. No way. It's not happening. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? He's anticipating rhetorically a question someone might ask. As if someone might say, well, since grace covers my sin, since grace grants forgiveness, Why should I not just go ahead and live and do whatever I want to so that God's grace may be even more abundant in my life? If that's the way it works, why can't I do what I want to? Paul answers that and says you can't because you are dead to sin. Interesting word we'll look at. Now, verse 13, he he goes on in the same chapter. He says, neither, here's, here's some more instruction. Neither yield your members, that is the parts of your body, as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto unto God. His his reasoning is, is fairly simple here. Since you're dead to sin, he's saying, Uh, You shouldn't be offering your bodies to sin as an instrument of wickedness, as a tool for unrighteousness. That's what you used to do. But rather offer them to God now as those who have been brought from death to life and the parts of your bodies uh, to him to be used as instruments of righteousness. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God that those that are alive from the dead, as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness from God. I'll reiterate what he has said in verse 1. You are dead to sin. Now, what does this mean? Well, the, the idea in this passage has been so misunderstood I think it requires us today to take a careful look at what Paul is saying. Let me point you to the verb, you are dead. In in English, the word are is not there, it's implied, but that's a good rendering. That's how we would express it. But the verb Paul uses, you're dead, uh, is aorist. In In the Greek language, and I'm certainly no Greek scholar, but 
In the Greek language, whenever you see an aorist, you, what you need to realize is that in most cases, that means that it is a completed action once for all completed in the past. And it doesn't, in this case, it doesn't have to be completed again. It's happened. And frankly, you can't carry it out again. You are dead to sin once for all. Now, what does that mean? You say, when I get up in the morning and I, you know, along the way during my day, I'm tempted. I don't feel very dead to sin. I feel alive to sin. That's not what Paul's talking about here. Uh, you say that when I'm tempted, I struggle with sin. I fail often. Well, we all do. But that's not what Paul is talking about here. Yet he is using a reality as motivation for you and I to overcome sin. You are dead to sin. How then can you live any longer therein? Now think about what he's saying. Paul's referring to the change that's been wrought in us when we trusted Christ. The moment we were saved, we were regenerated. The Holy Spirit came to live inside of us. There, there, there occurred a permanent change in our life. Our, our union is with Christ. We were made a part of Him spiritually, permanently, eternally. We were made a part of Him. That union with Christ has rendered us dead to sin. Now, in this chapter, Romans chapter 6, you may be wondering, you may wonder at times, what, what does the idea of baptism have to do with any of this? Well, Paul is giving to us the very reason that we baptize to begin with. Nobody, no, The Bible never says that the physical act of baptism, the water, washes our sins away. It doesn't do that. The, the physical act of baptism symbolically points to what has spiritually already happened. And so when a person, this is one of the reasons I'm a Baptist, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible doesn't say anything in the world about sprinkling. I understand sprinkling the blood and all of that, but that, listen, that's a long bridge to cross to, to, to get from that Old Testament idea to the, to the New Testament idea of infant baptism or even of sprinkling. But there's another form that, that really presents what Paul is talking about here to a T, and that is a immersive baptism by water. Now think about it. That, that act of being lowered into the water represents a person being lowered into a grave. Why is a person put into a grave? Why was Jesus put into a grave? Because he was dead. Why are human beings now put in the grave? We don't bury people unless they're dead. What kind of response does a dead person have? They don't have any response. They can't have any response. Uh, they're incapable of responding. I've always said when preaching this passage in others, the moment in my life that a dead person responds to anything I say, I'm going to stop preaching funerals. <laughs> Not going to happen anymore. Dead people don't respond. Dead people are not tempted. Dead people are not stimulated. Dead people don't respond to temptation. And so what Paul is saying is that your union with Christ in his death, you're dead now to sin. But also to his resurrection. What happens when we baptize? We don't leave people under too long anyway, do we? No, we bring them back up. Why? Because as going under the water represents being buried with Christ, because we're dead to sin, coming up out of the water represents our being alive in Christ, being raised again by His supernatural power in our spirit. The same, same power that raised Him from the dead is what grants us newness of life and will one day grant us newness of physical life when we are raised from the grave. Well, that aorist verb is so instructive. We're dead to sin. We have no more part with sin. We are changed forever. But why do we still struggle? Well, James Montgomery Boyce has, has given a list of, of things that this does not mean. And I think he's spot on with each one of these. Let me go through these with you. First of all, he, Boyce says that 
our being dead to sin does not mean, number one, that it is my duty to die to sin. Now, I'm told to die to my desires. That's part of what Romans chapter 12, verse 1 is, placing yourself on the altar as a living sacrifice. But we don't have to go back and reenact what Paul has said is already has already happened. It's not my duty to die to sin once for all. That's already happened. Now, I might need to bring that to pass in my life in different ways, but I don't die to sin. I'm already dead to sin. Secondly, uh, in the same vein, uh, it does not mean that I'm commanded to die to sin. That's not what Paul is saying here. It's not what he's saying. The aorist tense means it's already happened. You are dead to sin. Now, because of that, here are the ramifications. Here is how you should live. Number three, the fact that Paul says you are and and are completely dead to sin doesn't mean that I'm cons- to consider sin a dead force within me. It's not the right way to look at it. It doesn't mean that sin as it exists in our life is dead now. That brings confusion because we we ask ourselves, why do I still act the way I do? Why do I still suffer from temptation? Well, understand that Paul is making a pronouncement of a permanent standing, a position we have in Christ. These things are only borne out practically as we do what Paul says to do in chapter 12, and that's present our bodies a living sacrifice. Number four, Boyce says that this does not mean that I am dead to sin uh, so long, that should read, as I am gaining mastery over it. No. It doesn't mean that you're dead to sin as long as you're not sinning, but you're alive to sin as long as you are. No. Positionally, Paul said, you are dead to sin. Christ has enacted a change in your life, and that's why there's a tension. But number five, he also states that this does not mean that sin in me has been eradicated. You knew that before I said it, didn't you? We still drag this body of death, as he's going to use the imagery in chapter 7. We still are clothed in this body of death in which uh, lives the remnants of our sinful nature. Number six, this does not mean that counting myself dead to sin makes me insensitive to it. If anything... I warn you, counting yourself dead to sin will inflame the the uh, anger of the evil one. He will do everything he can to keep us from living out that truth. So the fact that he says we are dead to sin does not mean that counting myself dead to sin makes me insensitive to it. No, we'll be tempted to the day we die. John Owen put it this way. He said, uh, we are to be about killing sin. More specifically, he said, uh, you need to be killing sin or sin will kill you. So what Paul is saying is the only reason you have to move forward with placing yourself on the altar and the only hope you have of overcoming sin in your life, the the only glimmer of hope you possess as a human being for ever doing anything right or well or pleasing to God is this fact. You are dead to sin. Your union with Christ has placed you in a different category. You know, it's really not right for us to refer to ourselves as sinners, even though we we see sin in our lives every single day. It's not right to refer to ourselves as sinners. Paul doesn't. Paul says, no, you're dead to sin. Then he says, because of this, based on this, why should you live any longer therein? So this idea of dying to live is greatly enhanced when we look at what Paul has pronounced in our life. Christ has accomplished it. The Holy Spirit's brought it to pass at the moment of regeneration. Uh, The finished work of Christ is the only thing we base any of this on. 
His death, his burial, his res- resurrection form the pattern for our experience, both that has already occurred and that is yet to come. By, I mean, by what has already occurred, that which has occurred spiritually, we have been made alive. We are dead to sin, but we have been raised to walk in newness of life. Then one day, one day, even though our body may be laid beneath the silent clods of that valley, wherever they are, wherever the members of our body are placed, we have this hope, we have this promise that like as he was brought forth from the dead, so shall also we be brought back to life to live forever physically in that day with him. Now, I've included a summary statement here, and this ties it all together. This is the logic of Paul's argument. Therefore, because of what God has said and what the work of Christ has accomplished in regard to your past, that you're dead to sin, since that's true, beloved, based on the finished work of Christ, that I'm dead to sin, And that because of that, I can no longer return to a life of sin. Oh, you can sin, but it is not the same, is it? If it is, you've got a problem. The problem is you've never been born again. But even though you sin, you know it's different. You know it's not the same. And you can't return to a life of sin and stay there. Because of that, I can no longer return to a life of sin. I might as well, then, get on with the task of living for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, see, I, I think Paul, what Paul is, is combating here is what uh, I see a lot of people struggle with. And as soon as I read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, a lot of people say, oh, but that's so hard. I just can't do that. If you know Christ, you can and honestly, and we'll talk about this next week, either here or in our building, we shall see. Uh, if we fail to place ourselves on the altar of self-sacrifice, giving up our personal desires, putting ourselves at least second, uh, preferably third behind anybody else, with God being first, Unless, if we fail to do that, what we are in reality saying is, I don't believe what you've said. Now, this whole thing's a paradox. Is That's where we're going to pick up next week. We, we are to surrender our lives because of the price he paid. But we are also to surrender our lives because of the past he's eradicated. But as we're going to see next week, We must surrender our lives because of the meaning of this paradox. The only way to live is to die. (laughs) It's not to gather to yourself everything you want to have all your dreams come true. Nope. The only way to find true life is to allow yourself to die. That doesn't make sense. And as we'll see next week, it goes against everything. Every single thing the world says to you, every single television show, every single uh, secular um, act of momentum or or meaning or message, everything is is inherently possessed by the idea that I am more important to me <laughs> than anything else. And by the way. It's pretty easy to feel that way because we're born that way. If I could if I could identify the one enemy of our soul, it would be this message that we hear daily from our own flesh. This is the devil doesn't have to say it. You know what I think about the devil whispering in your ear. That's not his voice, that's your voice. That's the real you talking. I'm more important than this. 
Well, it sure doesn't sound like that fits in the Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and it doesn't. I'll give you a hint for next week. It doesn't fit with what Jesus has said either. And it doesn't fit with what Paul has said in Romans chapter 1. Because the world thinks one way, we're to think another. But you're going to have to wait on that. I trust this has been a blessing to you. I pray that you'll be seeking ways and praying and earnestly thinking about what it means to die so that your life can be everything not only that you want to be, but that God wants it to be. That's what's most important. Father, thank you for this truth. Thank you, God, for this paradox as we will see next week. Lord, the world sends so many messages into our lives that conflict with God's Word. It is so imperative that we find out and understand the clear meaning of what God says, and what your Word says, so that we'll not be confused by the world's message. I think of our young people. Lord, I think that every young person going into adulthood has this struggle inside of them. and They've got to figure it out. They've got to... They got to make this decision whether they're going to be conformed to the world and to think like the world. And I see so many of them that are. And then there are those who make up their mind that they'll not be conformed to this world, but instead they'll be transformed by the power of God's Word. May that be the case in every one of our lives. Let that happen that we might honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining me. I trust that has been a blessing to you. I I hope that as you have heard these uh, encouragements today, you have remembered what you were, but also realized and are thankful even now for what God has made you. We are different, aren't we? I'm so thankful we're dead to sin. Uh, not, Not that I'm able to live up to that every day, But that is still the truth. God has said it, and I have to claim it and live by it. And so that is my one of my great motivations, as should be yours, for presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice. Again, this is a life of death, and dying is the only way to live. Let me encourage you to continue to to, um, pray for each other, uh, love each other, minister to each other as you have opportunity. I ask that you pray for uh, Matt and Kendra Cannon this week. Uh, many of you may know um, that that Kendra lost her baby. Um, in God's wisdom and sovereignty, this has happened. Uh, Matt and Kendra had a funeral for their child this week. Let's pray for them that God would give them comfort and and give them peace through this and hold them up in this trying time, as difficult as other things are then this has happened to them. I also know that many of you are continuing to undergo treatments and have doctor visits and other things happening. Let's pray for our folks in the rest home. They, and in nursing care facilities, they're not in a place where they're able to have visitors, of course. And so let's pray for them, all right? Pray for each other. Pray for me for continued wisdom, for our leadership. And church, we really, really hope to see you soon. But we are praying for God's wisdom as to the timing. We want it to be right. I have spoken to several people. I've I've spoken to some of you, and you have encouraged us that thus far we have made the right decision. Every single congregation that's opened up in our area has suffered infections. And some of those individuals have have been sick to the point of death, and even one or two have died. It's going to happen. This, this is real, but, but we don't want to prolong this. We don't want to stay out any longer than we have to. We want to be wise in our approach. We want to have wisdom as to the timing and manner of our reopening. Okay, so um, pray for me, pray for us, pray for our church, pray for each other, and I will do my best to pray for you. I love all of you, and I hope to see you very, very soon. I mean that very, very soon.